Hi, welcome to the Wellbeing Show. Good to have you back um, here towards the end of April 2021, where things are beginning to look up in terms of the whole COVID thing, particularly in Europe. Um, uh, I'm Noel, I'm your host, and I'm joined by Jules, uh, Jude, this evening. Um, and <laughs> so I will tell you why I made that mistake later on. Um, it, it, it's appropriate to the show. Um, uh, but anyway, I'm joined by Jude this evening, uh, who's going to introduce uh, himself later, um, themselves later. And um, we've got a great show ahead. Um, uh, discussing some really important issues around uh, gender and gender identity. Um, uh, just before we get going though, just to remind you it's a live show. Um, you're welcome to join us on any one of the social media platforms that we use, Facebook Live, uh, Twitter through Periscope and also on YouTube. Um, unfortunately you can't phone in for this show because uh, I'm in foreign climes with my boy, hence the sort of Golden Gate Bridge behind me. I'm not actually in America, but uh, if you call, um, because my computer's tethered to my phone, it'll just shut the show off. So please don't call. <laughs> so let's see anywhere I've got um, broadband is through the phone at the moment. So um, anyway, jumping off that and into, hello, Jude. Hi. <laughs> hey, Jude. Hey. <laughs> I get that so much now. I know, I know but you chose me. I did. I did. <laughs> it's not like something gave you. moment and on the day that I was deciding whether or not to have it, and that song came on. I thought, I Why did I choose this? Isn't it? It's just a lovely <laughs> band. That's a good choice. So, um, so good to see. It's been bloody ages since I I've last. Thank you. How's it been this year? You have you been coping through the whole sort of COVID lockdown stuff? I hate to say it, but I've had the best year of my life. And you know, as much as I know it's been so tough for so many people and awful and traumatic and tragic, um, I've really thrived in the last year and for many reasons that we've we spoke about previously. But um, I, I feel that there was, you know, this kind of pandemic, it kind of brought out the worst and the best in people and, um, you know, really brought out a lot of trauma, but also helped people to kind of see it, you know, and see what they needed to face and look at and that was the case for me and it was kind of the real yeah the real cherry on the cake for me I'd say. Right so you've sort of been faced with yourself and decided you like yourself. Oh, it was so bizarre honestly the way you couldn't write it it just everything that happened just happened in such a perfect way um, it, it as much as you know it was difficult because I had to leave the home that we were in all of a sudden as soon as the pandemic hit, I had no work coming in, real stress and anxiety. And I, I stayed at a friend's flat that was free in London and ended up there for seven weeks, but then was broken up with. And of course, like my natural reaction to when I get broken up with being a serial relationship data, one would say possibly love addict and codependent is that I jump into another relationship and the beauty of the lockdown meant that I couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> so I was stuck in this flat just the only relationship you could have was with yourself. Good Lord. It was, I, know, I mean, I, I had to go through the hump first. The hump was very, t you know, there were nightmares, PTSD, all the stuff that I was running away from being in these relationships um, really hit me. Um, but it was one of those moments where it was just, I, I went through it. You know, I didn't go around it, run away from it. I went through it and I came through the other side. Just, right. I mean, it was definitely gradual, but I focused on, mind body and spirit and I actually googled I was at desperation trying to find ways and resources to help me and I actually stumbled across meditation um a yeah. wonderful it's called the law of attraction that I thought was a fad and a load of rubbish but it ties into metacognitive therapy and belief systems and I began to practice it just made a vision board of how I'd like to see my life you know and the vision board started coming to fruition, believe it or not. I had Vogue plunked off of my vision board and I thought, I'm going to become a model was my thing. I'm going to become a model. That's what's going to happen. Fast forward a month later and it's exactly what happened. <laughs> I mean, one of the more annoying things about you is that in every single incarnation of you, you've been drop dead gorgeous, which is just like, <laughs> it's just one of the things that the rest of us are incredibly jealous of and envious of. <laughs> Uh, you're one of the few people I know that can do these transitions and just be completely beautiful, whichever gender you decide to be. That's very is, kind of you. Really, to, if you want to, I, I, you're, you're annoyed with Jude as much as I am. You can turn around and slap her, him, <laughs> any time you want, quite frankly. 
I have to say, the, the most empowering narrative, I think, for me was the fact that like, I was very badly bullied at school. And I, my, my nickname at school was Ugly Duckling, believe it or not. So no! <laughs> wanted for the way that I looked at school. And bullied and called a boy and all this kind of stuff. For, you know, expressing myself the way that I wanted to express myself. And so, like, I developed, I think, a lot of shame around that sort of sense of identity and, and being seen as a boy. And it wasn't reflect, you know, who I was wasn't reflected externally. I mean, it was illegal to even talk about or share or promote any kind of LGBT knowledge. That's right. Yes, I remember that. I remember those days. Well, throughout my school... The Thatcher government changed the law and said that you can't positively promote any... Do they call it alternative family structures or something? LGBT literature nothing in any public services <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. and it yeah. was um you know up until I was 17 and so there was just no education there was no awareness I didn't really know anyone like me there was no social media there was no yeah. like readily accessible information by which to kind of really identify myself or just know that it was okay to be who I was and so I think that's just the side of myself that I shut away and I tried very hard to kind of adapt myself to become a version of who I thought the world wanted me to be yeah. um, for X amount of years, well, up until three and a half years ago, really. And that's just been, yeah. you know, this process of being ongoing. But it, it, I have to say in this last year, it's been so empowering because obviously going into this industry where I'm celebrating the, my aesthetic, but also my identity, the way I look, the fact that, you know, expressing myself the way I want to express myself just feels so good. It's just rewriting the narrative to so much trauma for me. And so yeah. you know, I think modeling can mean, you know, some like just, you know, people it, acting as clothes horses to some people and not mean very much to them. But actually, to me, it's just such a... Yeah, part. but to be honest, every model I've known has been sort of socially aware. Maybe it's just the models I know, but are out there making um, some very important points about um, the, what we do to people and how we destroy them through image and so on, um, and how we need to change that narrative so that people can own themselves and love themselves. Absolutely. And that's the key thing here that, that we need to do. So, and yeah. um, I mean, sort of for those that don't know that, I may be wondering what Jude and I are talking about. Um, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the area that we're in is talking about um, gender identity, uh, transsexuality, intersectionality, intersexuality um, and uh, sort of everything in between, if there is anything in between. Um, yeah. So when I first met Jude, Jude was called Jules. Mm. Um, and um, and that was a long time ago now. I mean, sort of not quite when dinosaurs were walking. <laughs> well, you're, three... you're still a child in comparison to me. But... Wow. Well, <laughs> oh, God, you are. Get out of here, mate. Don't <laughs> even go there with me. Sort of fishing for a compliment and got it. There you so, go. Still <laughs> able to bat the eyelids and get people to do what you want. Um, but yeah, we, we, we met when you identified as a, a woman at that point, and comfortably so, I think, in many yeah. ways. And I, and I do, and I'm very honest about that, and I say to, to the people, because I do talks on the subject, um, you know, and I say, you know, some trans people don't like to talk about their past, but, you know, I do, and I feel very comfortable in doing so, and I'm kind of a bit of an open book when it comes to this topic, because right. I'm very passionate about raising awareness and you know, kind of saying it how it was, but I did, you know, the majority of my life, in fact, 30 years of my life, I spent identifying as female and thinking that's who I was. Um, yeah. And actually, you know, until I was, and it's funny because for those of us in recovery who have been through the recovery process and have gone, you know, into a meeting or into a, a session and they've heard people speak and they've said, oh, you're like me, you know, and you have that process of identification where you figure out who you are based on someone else's experience well that's exactly what happened to me I met my first trans person trans people if you like and that's when the penny dropped for me and not to be a stereotype it happened in Brighton because I moved to Brighton <laughs> but there I met you know and I happened to go to an evening called the Museum of Transology which was in a, a museum and an exhibition of trans objects and there were hundreds of trans people there so I literally had a crash course in you know who I am and through hundreds of hundreds of trans people at once and it was it was really enlightening it was it was overwhelming because I just didn't know where to start at that point but I knew that I identified with these people and I was trying to figure myself out through all these other people and one thing that I learned and I'm still learning is that I learned very early on to kind of look outside and look externally to try and validate myself and find a sense of self and 
what part of my not just recovery codependent recovery all my everything that I'm doing is to actually learn to go inside and listen to that yeah. inner voice that I've been ignoring for so many years to find out who yeah. I am and I've, I've had to do that and it's just been and I, you know it's been reclaiming that autonomy that was taken away from me you know as, an, as a child because our children they already have a sense of who they are and who they're going to be and I feel like this, that's kind of stripped away from them in, in the society that we live, we live in in one way or another, you know. I think this kind of applies to all of us in some way, if you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. I mean, we're talking before the show, and I think maybe we'll bring that conversation up now. We can come back to the sort of trauma issues and the um, addiction issues later, I think, and that'd be useful to unpack some of that. Because um, ultimately, that's how you and I got to know each other from those communities. Um, and, um, and, and the links between the various things. But I, I think um, one of the interesting conversations we started before the show was to ask and begin to remember some of the history and her story and they story mm. uh, that existed prior to our current period in Western sort of hegemonic thinking and binary thinking about um, sort of gender and what gen certainly gender, I think most people these days accept is yeah. socially constructed. Okay, I, mean, I think most people wouldn't argue that, most sensible people. But then the whole idea of um, trans um, is relatively new for a lot of people, um, but it's not new for the human race. Absolutely not. And that's something that's been lost. It's a history that isn't taught in our schools. And why would it be? You know, because we glorify a lot of the kind of key events that we consider important, but we don't learn this in history. And it wasn't until I actually stumbled across an amazing Guardian article that spoke about like, indigenous cultures native americans you know yeah. kind of colonialism cultures that used to actually separate um celebrate and hold um gender diverse people lgbtq people in very high regard they were considered counselors wise people and i find that i found that fascinating and it wasn't until a kind of more religious christian like communities from france spain europe came over and condemn these people as sodomites and you know essentially silence this part of history and it's yeah. you know it's not new that's the thing and it's almost like we're making this rediscovery of, of who we were and and they had such a wise outlook about diversity in general and this society is just so rigid and so binary and I, I question you know when we've got seven plus billion people on the face of the planet and not two identical twins are entirely the same you know they everyone's different in one way or another why do we find this concept of diversity just so difficult to comprehend you know because actually we are diverse by nature you know we're all one but we're all you know we're all well, diversity is what nature wants and diversity is health um, the way i often explain it to people is this if you imagine two farms both have five fields um i in one they farm all the same crop in all five fields in the other they farm five different crops which is the better healthier farm well the one that has the diverse range of crops obviously uh, and that's also true neurologically for us as human beings and culturally as human beings it's also uh, on a species level uh, and i guess i don't really expect people to have this sort of level of knowledge but it's fairly standard uh in the animal kingdom the fish kingdom the birds etc uh for there to be a range of options uh in terms of um sexual bodies mm. so there'll be what we would call female, there'll be trans bodies, there'll be um, what we would call male and other variants of that, simply because that makes sense from a biological perspective. Mm. Um, be, and there's also asexual bodies that can change from one to the other. And again, it just makes sense from a survival perspective. And given that we're good at survival, it would be bonkers. So uh, I'm gonna introduce some other terms that people might not have heard, but. Um, uh, sort of hermaphroditism is a word, which I'm sure you've come across too. Yeah. Um, now, what most people don't know, again, I wouldn't expect people to, is that the um, sexual markers in humans, there's over 40 of them. And the genitalia, which is the one that everybody points at usually, are only a small number of them and probably the least important definers of biological gender. Mm. So, um, but biological gender, if there is such a thing, but biological sex is much more complicated um, than genitalia um, and uh, it, it, in and of itself. And there are many options within that. 
And it's a bit like, you have you heard of the Kinsey scale? No. Okay, the Kinsey was a researcher into sexual identity um, and um, came up with this concept of this scale where um, people would, some people were definitely heterosexual at one end of the scale and some people definitely homosexual at the other end of the scale. But most people were somewhere in between. Some people were right in the middle, but you know, you might have been more towards one side or more towards the other. And those that were, and, and that's the same for biology. Absolutely. It's just a simple fact. And you can reflect that to gender. So it's the same for, bio, for sex, it's the same for gender, it's the same for sex, sexuality. I believe yeah. we all exist on some form of spectrum in every aspect. And I think it's a great way to look at it as an umbrella, as a spectrum, as a scale, like you have all these shades of, of yeah. you know, of grey of, of diversity in the middle and, and people can just fall on each and every one of them yeah. and it's the unrelated like I think it's a myth that like so many people get sexuality and gender diversity kind of mixed up they just assume yeah. that it's unrelated that the LGBT community is about being gay and it's not it's about you know your gender isn't associated to your sexuality like my sexuality has changed over time I'm actually you know and I'm not afraid to say sexually attracted to men too since transitioning and that's really common yeah. I found that fascinating because I was like what is that why has that happened you know and uh so many trans people I know are attracted to same sex or multiple sexes and it just it kind of really kind of myth busts that idea that you know we're it's somehow related and we're somehow changing our gender just to be more socially acceptable in terms of our sexuality no that's not it you know it's we're so much more complex than that as human beings yeah and it's, I think it's interesting that um and, and again you know we go I'm old enough to remember this stuff you're not yet um, <laughs> but I remember the 70s and when questions about gender and identity were really being asked for the first time seriously in sort of our generation they hadn't been asked really historically properly before that since 17th 16th 17th centuries and the 16th century, for people that don't know, again, a little bit of background info, um, was when uh, the Bible, which up till then had been written in Latin, the Christian Bible, up to then had been written in Latin, um, and most people didn't read, they didn't know, certainly didn't know to read Latin, and the monks would transcribe the letters, they would copy them literally from one book to another. Um, but then... Um, the Bible started being translated into indigenous languages. First, the first time is in German, I think, and then into British as with the development of the printing presses. Um, and with that translation came the issues of how do you translate the meaning of specific words? Uh, and of course, this is the politics of translation. Uh, it reflected the politics of each country, particularly the gender politics mm -hmm. and the definitions of certain words that were translated. Um, to mean man and woman, uh, one being um, subservient to the other, um, which didn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily in the original writing of the Bible, but it was politically necessary at the time to do that. Um, hence, and of course you then had things like the witch trials and all this sort of stuff, and it was very much the hegemony of um, how property was um, sort of, uh, property rights were passed on through the patrilineal line and and then that was exported as you said um, internationally uh, by the Spanish, the Portuguese, the British mm -hmm. through uh, empire uh, and when they were confronted by say indigenous populations in North America which had a minimum of three genders usually but usually quite a lot more than that um, and, and they were decimated I mean, absolutely decimated um, and seen as savages and less than human um, and it, because they celebrated diversity. And it's so interesting as well, because it's almost like that, that you know, that people cottoned on to the fact that religion had such a power over people. And so they found forms of basically infiltrating forms of control over people by yeah. kind of like mistranslating, you know, religion. Yeah. Um, which I'm sure stemmed from a very inclusive spirituality, actually, and it's just kind of been made very rigid. And now it's kind of affected our culture for generations, you know, like all this discrimination that we still experience today is kind of formed on these ideas that... Yeah, I mean, we can think of it intersectionally as well. I mean, 
the idea that Jesus is white is completely bonkers. There you go, yeah. I mean, sort of where where the hell does that come from? He was in the Middle East. Yeah. A sea mite in the Middle East. I mean, what what bit of your insane sort of racist yeah. brain thinks that this person could have been white? And it's, it's still, like bonkers, isn't it? It's unbelievable. And it's just it just shows us how much we've been brainwashed in this society. And when I bring up you know, these kind of concepts in schools or businesses, it's like people are almost looking at me sometimes like I'm like, you know, I'm the crazy one. What are you talking about? And I'm just thinking, no, no, no. <laughs> like, this is the truth. This is the stuff that you've been distanced from. You've been kept away from and you've been, we've essentially been brainwashed. You know, we've, we're, yeah. we're part of it. Well, they say history is written by the victors, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and we should be aware that there has been, a power struggle going on. Very definitely, there's been a power struggle going on. Um, and uh, we're seeing sort of liberationist stuff happening. And again, we were talking just before the show, thinking about the US election and mm. uh, what Biden, some of the first things Biden did, uh, appointing a, a trans person to his cabinet, rolling back some of the divisive legislation. Um, but let's, let's talk about, you know, as though um, you and I are not as enlightened as we are. Um, and not as right on as we are. And let's sort of talk maybe about some of the sort of straightforward, simple stuff that, um, you know, might cause people cause for concern. Um, I don't know why, but, uh, you know, so, I mean, it, it tends to be in the tabloids. We get these sort of tabloid newspapers about um, sort of, you know, uh, worries about um, changing rooms in swimming pools and um, sort of uh, somebody suddenly deciding some hulking bloke deciding he's a woman mm. all of a sudden, and then winning uh, all the women's races and all that sort of stuff. It's trivialization of the issues, I know. Um, but I, I think that's where people are coming at it from. Um, and I guess you come across that a lot in terms of the sort of training that you do. Yeah. Very much so. And this is, you know, the, these, I mean, I have to say that the right wing media has a huge responsibility in the way that it paints the trans community and it's you know it, it's it's done well at kind of really tainting and poisoning the minds of so many people across the country it's got a huge responsibility because we spoke earlier about you know the the very high rates of mental health issues in the community addiction yeah. farm suicide and this you know doesn't just this isn't just the adult community this extends to you know the younger community um, and I'd argue that the reason for that is the ignorance, the lack of support and understanding, you know, the amount of discrimination that is still considered as socially acceptable, uh, you know, even at the level of the media, for example. Um, and, you know, a lot of the time, unaccepting families. And actually, that's the trauma that this community has to deal with. And I think it's fed by these kind of false ideas that the media just kind of feeds people um, about, you know, the trans community. I mean, I didn't know a trans person I know hundreds now and I mean hundreds um yeah. I don't know any kind of perpetrator burly men dressed in wigs going around like infiltrating women's bathrooms and trying yeah, to I've not come across it yet it doesn't exist it doesn't exist you know and if there's been one case in one prison one time you know I think what uh, a um, parent a parents evening asked me once about this you know there was a trans person that attacked somebody in a female prison now you know, but my argument was, well, how many cisgender people have attacked people in prisons? You're, you're giving me one example, like, really? And that's going to represent the entire community. Like, it's just, you know, and they will nitpick at these examples to try and kind of argue, argue them against us. And then the question of sport is just, you know, again, like, I'll hear um radio um reports on like you know it, these unfair advantages that trans people have and i just think well what's your argument to be exclusive of marginalized people is that your really your answer you're just going to say no you can't do it we can because we're privileged and you can't because you're not <laughs> and so we get to play the game you know that's just like that's not okay to communicate in that way like to really you know I think as well, again, we're coming back to diversity, the fact we're all different shapes, sizes, strengths, genetics, foot sizes for swimmers. Like people are just diverse. Like Casper Semenya produces a high amount of testosterone. No, we shouldn't just medicate her in order for her to compete. That's not okay either. Like this is the human body, like you rightly referred to earlier on. Like 
that's how the body works. It's sport that's inc- exclusive and, and only caters for, you know, the majority of, of, of able yeah. people, you know. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I think that um, <laughs> the, the question of sports is an interesting one because um, people are having arguments about a tiny minority of the population, high-class sports people, as though they're normal. And there's nothing normal about an Olympic level sports person. It's not me. It's not the normal population. And the the idea that that is held up as everyday human sort of uh, biology is bonkers. It's absolutely. How on earth are you using that as a standard example of a human body? Because that's definitely not. That's somebody who has set out on a lifelong mission to adapt their body to a specific regime to achieve specific results. Absolutely. That's not a natural phenomenon at all. There's sort of like ridiculous yeah. sort of argument to be made. I, th- I think um, for me, I remember when the Olympics came to uh, London last time and um, sort of, uh, I remember it a lot because it, it came to the edge of um, the Olympic Park is on the edge of Hackney where I live. Um, and I, I didn't get to see the main Olympics, but I did go to um, the um, uh, the other Olympic Games, which was for non able-bodied mm. sports personalities um, yeah. Paralympics. Um, and it is the best sports I've ever seen um, for one um, and there was nothing about it that uh, was based on any sort of norms mm. so they had a very complex structure in the Paralympics so I remember being in the swimming uh, and seeing the British girl um, mm. who won and one Wrangley in swimming pool I happened to be there that day. Um, and there were a whole range of bodies in the pool. Um, and they had a complex system of scoring that went on, which compensated for the different abilities mm. uh, and then gave you some of the most exciting sports you're ever going to see. And I, I'm like, I, I just have no time for somebody who simplifies it all mm. and says that, hey, you know, um, that Hussein Bolt is a normal human. He's not. That's why he's winning the gold medals because <laughs> he's not normal. I'm normal. I'd be nowhere and he'd kick my ass, quite yeah. frankly. Absolutely. Um, and, and the idea that that is what sports is, is nonsense because go to Paralympics. It's the most amazing sports you're ever going to see. And I'm going to say something even more sort of controversial here. The best ever football I've seen is in the women's league, not the men's league. And I mean, just dump the men's league. I, I, the women's cup final was on the other weekend. Best football you ever see, to be honest. And, then um, you, and I can't wait for the trans cup final because go. that's going to be really interesting football, really skilled. <laughs> so so all of these arguments, I just think piss off, go away. So if, it's just people trying to get attention. It's nonsense. And in the fact that they get aired as well, and that's the issue. It's like, I worry, uh, you know, who that affects. And I've just, you know, I've been involved with certain community projects and events where trans people are are portrayed as thugs, violent thugs, when in fact nothing violent, nothing thug-like was going on. You, Jude. I should worry. You should warn people about Jude. One of the most violent thuggy thug thugs in the world. That was on the front of the Daily Mail when it was just I held a few banners and just like <laughs> stood for our rights because you know <laughs> trans people basically trying to include <laughs> And who is that? what happens? And then unfortunately, you know, the parents of trans children will really you know, front pages, and then and that's the problem. And then they'll start being concerned for their young people, they won't fully understand the topic, and then yeah. Uh, and, and that's the issue and that's why I'm so passionate about getting out to as many you know schools young people businesses and that's what I've been doing I've genuinely been getting yeah. out there you know I was on the on Zoom to a and let's talk about the reality of it because up until 2019 being trans was defined as a mental illness and of course it's not no. um, and um, there is a history of abuse through mental health services mm-hmm. uh, and people being incarcerated having enforced um, uh, operations on them, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it, up until very recently, in the last, I think, stopped 10 years ago, hermaphroditic babies were surg- surgically operated on at birth by the decision oh. of the surgeon, would randomly make a decision about which sex they wanted to assign to that hermaphrodite, yeah. uh, rather than wait till they grew up and made their own decision. Um, oh, yeah. So, I mean, things have moved, but it, sort of that was the framing of it, was that 
trans was ill. Yeah, so absolutely. Was in- and I think like, uh, and to uh, intersex people as well who are still operate, I believe they're still being operated on as far as I'm aware. They are yeah. still considered to have um, a disorder, which, you know, and whereas the trans community, uh, you know, finally that kind of, that's been acknowledged as not being a mental health issue like gender di- identity disorder, but insects people are still fighting for their right. And, and again, it's funny how like, if you go through the LGBTQIA plus spectrum, like, you know, the lesbian and gay community had to fight for their rights, fight for their existence, fight for, you know, and it's, yeah. it's, they're still in inequality. Like it's more socially acceptable, for example, than it is to necessarily identify as trans. and the trans community are facing what the gay and lesbian community are facing back in the 80s in terms of like the lack of understanding, you know, the association to paedophilia. There's a lot of that that goes on, you know, um, it, the, how they're being condemned and being portrayed in the media, the fact that it's considered a choice. All that was aimed at gay and lesbian, the gay and lesbian community, you know, and, and so next in line is the trans community. And then behind us is the intersex community it's almost like each sort of minority group is coming to the forefront and going through the same process through history um Mm. you know interesting isn't it that we still we're still cyclical and the the, the reality behind i mean it's interesting as well i mean it's sad it's a tragedy that the reality behind the headlines that talk about that one person who was abusing uh, people and claimed a trans identity. Um, the reality behind that headline is the thousands upon thousands of kids who are trans, um, who many of whom will end up in a very damaged psychological position because they see themselves as bad and damaged in some way, uh, are afraid to be honest about who they are, um, afraid to talk about who they are and may end up harming themselves. And um, people in the trans community are more of a risk to themselves than anybody else through self-harm, addiction, suicide, etc. And that's always the case. That's always the case. But they are victims, not perpetrators. And um, in terms of thinking about, because you're no longer um, a, a victim, but you've been through that experience. Do you mind if we sort of circle back a little bit to talk yeah. about some of the sort of trauma issues and the addiction issues? Uh, and, and just- I don't wanted to throw a quick stat out there because the recent yeah. statistics of um, trans youth from um, under the age of 26 of attempted suicide. So it's a 48% of young trans people under the age of 26 said they have attempted suicide. So it's not even thought about its attempt, which is, I mean, half of the community. And that's those that have reported it have been brave enough to speak up with that. Yeah, I mean, in, in the non-trans community, it's less than 10%. There you go. So if you just think of that statistic, it's astronomically high. Um, but yeah, absolutely. And I can talk back at, you know, my kind of experience growing up because interesting. Well, let's yeah. just underline that point. And I'm going to ask people this. Um, yeah. what, what world do you want to live in, really? Do you want to live in a world where kids are trying to kill themselves um, because you won't allow them to use certain types of words? Mm. It's like, really, is that the world you want to live in, people? And they've, that's done, what they've done it in the States. They've done the studies to show if you support a young person through their transition sooner, they are happier later on in life. They've done that research in America. That's been done. That's been proven. <laughs> so there you go. And that's, you know, that shows supporting. Maybe our... we need the research on one level, but we don't need the research, do we? We don't. We, we know. I mean, come on, people. We yeah, know that. We if, if, you, if you love your children and it's your children we're talking about, that's it. You know, you accept them as they are and let them support them so that they grow and discover who they are. And that's it. End yeah. of conversation. The idea that your child has to fit your own prejudices is appalling. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, arguably, I think we can learn a lot from young people. I think they're the most authentic versions of people that there are because before they get churned into the social conditioning that we all go through, like they, they already know, like I already knew looking back and I actually lost myself through growing yeah. up in this world, if anything, um, and had to rediscover. It's almost like growing down and rediscovering who it was that I was originally after having gone through yeah. this absolute car crash, you know. Um, I think there's, there's also something... So let's deal with a, a, a sort of fantasy, I think, a lot of people have, and then we'll come back to your personal experience with that side. But there's this sort of fantasy, I think, that some people have that, 
And if we do discuss these things openly, what will happen is it'll spread like some illness and um, and people will catch it. And it, it's the opposite is true. Um, certainly my experience as, um, as a pretty boring 54 year old straight overweight bloke who's sort of, who's been around the block more times than I care to imagine. Um, so the conversations I have around these issues have been interesting and they've helped me think about who I am and consolidated my understanding of myself. I haven't sort of um, in any way, because so much of this, as you say, is very much about the stuff inside that we come to understand about ourselves. Yeah. And where we sort of look at the programming we've had, some aspects of it will accept and some we won't. Um, and all that's happened for me is I've become healthier and happier about myself mm. and fatter. That's the bit I don't, I'm going to need to sort that out, but that's COVID. Anyway, not, n- none of us can be as pretty as you. Coming back to your story, Jude, um, and um, so you were a little girl, pre mm. uh, but sort of labelled tomboy and ugly duckling and all that sort of stuff. Now that's, to be honest, it's a story I've heard a lot. It's really sad. Mm. I, I've heard this a lot, but sort of, can you remember back to those times what it was like, all of that? So, and what was sort of your experience of like gender and identity at that point? I think, you know, and I, it's interesting because I had, I had a dressing up box actually, which is a way Did that, I, yeah, where I used to sort of to explore my expression. I used to wear shirt and ties, and, but I'd do it sort of in the privacy of my own home. So behind closed doors was somewhere where that, where I felt able to explore, you know, an aesthetic that I felt more comfortable with. It's not to say that I was going to be trans, like so many of us like to wear many different things, but I think, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think for me at that time, it definitely was like that, me exploring a side of myself that I felt unsafe to explore outside. Um, But when I did sort of like, you know, take the risk and cut my hair short and go to school like that, that's when I was bullied. And, you know, I I was different um, as many of us are, but like, I just, I was a very easy target for bullies and just presenting in that way. And I think, you know, not, like I said earlier, not having that reflection of myself externally, like I just had, I already had a lot of shame and I grew up in quite a traumatic environment with my family structure as well. So, you know, I had a very high stress environment at school, at home, all this kind of going on and and I just internalized so much shame I had so much shame wrapped around the side of myself and then I figured out like as I was growing older that I also wasn't straight I was attracted to other girls so I had that whole shame I remember swearing to myself that I'd never tell anybody about that and so I had this kind of I just had this entire sense of shame of who I was on the inside and really just close that person in a box and try to conform as best I could looking at on the outside of who I thought I should be and um you know I just I was a very very unhappy person for a very long time you know I had a very very you know I'm not poor me because I'm incredibly free and happy today but it was a very very tough experience and tough existence growing up but it's given me a hell of a lot of resilience and insight well, um, I know you're not in the pity party and sort of I'm asking these questions because I think you will go into anything like that but I, I'd like people to understand though what it's like for a child there yeah. and sort of because a lot of it is completely avoidable if we if, if we are accepting of children and their natural exploration of their identity um, mm. which is what we're talking about so what did you do I mean you bottled it up but how did it express itself this sadness and well, I had, to, I had to find coping mechanisms, <laughs> um, you know, to cope. And I remember I had, I had tics from a very early age, like clearing throat tics, very high anxiety, like stress in my shoulders. So I had a lot of, you know, trauma and stuff trapped in my body and yeah. unable to kind of without an outlet, I suppose. And I kind of describe it as a bit of like a pressure cooker of emotions, just ready to sort of explode, which is exactly what happened in my adolescence, you know, and... Right. I found those ways to cope and for me that was drugs and alcohol um you know people that I attached to and I just had to I found ways to kind of anesthetize a lot of that stuff but it did explode you know it explode at times that I was taking substances and you know I'd harm myself and and you know put myself in very dangerous positions but there was this kind of like romanticism with the danger because it was you know I struggled to exist you know I struggled to cope on a day-to-day basis and so 
Um, um, and do you mind? Um, yeah. Obviously, you'll tell me to shut up and leave it alone if you yeah. don't want to talk about it. But um, uh, did, I mean, adolescence would be um, classically a time when uh, for trans, mm -hmm. uh, the changes in body would be really challenging. If they're not, if your body isn't changing into the one that feels comfortable that you identify with most, that's that's got to be hard work, Jude. And I'm glad, I'm so glad you brought that up because it is the time when, that's hugely triggering for trans people is puberty, when your body actually changes. Um, yeah. Mine did, you know, I was really curvy and it was just so, I can't tell you how uncomfortable it felt to, for my body to change in that way. And that's... The, yeah, because you would have got, I mean, as a, as a uh, uh, in the um, almost ideal female form in one sense, the... the Form that was, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass, but the form that was really valued culturally in society, it was defined as sexy. It would have been defined as very, very sexy. And um, sort of, I, I sort of knew that person. Um, and it's not how I knew you, but it was striking. Um, and to be in that sort of body and feel uncomfortable with it would have been, I can't imagine how confusing that would be because on one level you're getting all these probably mm. some intrusive and horrible shit, but you're also, um, because of your um, sexual identity at the time, you would have also got a lot of attention that you liked as well. well. Yeah, it was bizarre because it's like, I was constantly battling with why I found, found it uncomfortable to associate yeah. my sexuality as well. Like I didn't understand why I found, because when I, obviously, and not knowing, the fact that I didn't know is, utterly bizarre to me like it just goes to show, like the fact that inside I knew but I didn't know like I wasn't conscious and aware or, or knew that I was trans absolutely not like um but when I found out the penny dropped to so many different things it's like oh of course I didn't feel like a lesbian because I wasn't one you know because I wasn't female of course like and the eating disorders as well that's another thing and of course that's really high in the trans community also is eating disorders not surprising at all um, yeah. is the controlling of the curves you know I was trying to control the my curves and my and the, the parts of myself I found so deeply uncomfortable um and the but of course the penny just dropped to so many things when I looked back and that oh I'm trans and then that related to that and that and it's just like everything all the drop, dots sort of joined together and I was like it now makes so much sense but I, I genuinely felt like I was going through the world blind like I didn't and what do you think what do you think Jude would have been like if Jude had gone to that sort of trans conference at the age of five or six? Well, we can't know, but what do you imagine would have happened? If or I'd seven been, or eight or 12 yeah. or 13 or whatever it is. I've been able to discover myself sooner. I would have avoid. I 100% would have avoided. I think I need, I would have needed to unpick the shame around it. I think I would have had a lot of internalized transphobia, even if I'd known back then, I would have been terrified anyone or or acknowledging it if I could have what I've got today much younger I 100% would have grown up a much health, healthier and happier person my recovery would have been a lot easier because I did you know I did a good seven and a half well hang on more than that about 10 years of you know recovery in pain <laughs> like white knuckling and, and no surprise that I ended up in other cross addictions because of course, like I would have had to have found other ways to cope with the discomfort. And it's, I think absolutely no coincidence that the one year after my top surgery and I'm, it's summer and I'm in Italy and I'm connecting with myself and I'm going internally and having a spiritual awakening for the first time. I don't think that's any mistake either. I think it finally, I align to myself and therefore everything for, for like fit into place and I'm finally experiencing the kind of recovery that people used to talk about in my early days and I couldn't really properly understand because it was just impossible to be in like so much kind of emotional physical and social discomfort and experience the joys of recovery like and that's mm. not to say that people that haven't had surgery or gone through the process of transition can't experience recovery but for me it absolutely needed this to be I needed to be in myself to truly recover yeah. and I would describe yeah. it journey of recovery to self-discovery it's all been part and parcel of the same thing you know finding out what belongs to me and what doesn't you know the childhood trauma the social conditioning all the shit and saying me as myself as Jude and perfect as I am happy and free you know and that's it's just wonderful honestly wonderful yeah, and I 
I've seen the pictures that you put out as a as a model mm -hmm. um, promoting the sort of trans images. They're, um, they're striking and gorgeous. <laughs> I mean, really, really moving and touching. I mean, it's beautiful stuff. I um, I sort of, I, I'm gonna have to say this because I know you passed it. I remember talking to you about it, and you were like, "Oh, should I do it?" And I'm like, "Well, I can't really tell you whether you should do it or not." But it was extraordinary like, sort of time. I mean, sort of really uh, touching and moving to sort of even being a small part of it, just as somebody knew you vaguely. But um, I mean, really, uh, uh, sort of, uh, it's amazing. I mean, my first experience of sort of trans culture was reading April Ashley's story. I don't know if you know, you, do you know April Ashley? It was um, a trans female and became an international model. Um, really interesting book to read. Um, story about that. And, and she did what a lot of early trans people did in those days, which she, she had to um, leave her home country to get the operations done. And she got them done in Brazil and stuff like that. And um, because of, particularly because of the transformation she was making from sort of male to female, it was, you know, Brazil was the obvious choice. It being the plastic surgery capital for the female form on the planet. So um, <laughs> that's where you'd go. But um, I, I sort of, the, the point being this, that I, I, and sort of people, again, they trivialise the whole issue. You, you, being trans isn't, you can't just walk up to a doctor and say, do you mind just, operating on me please I just feel a bit odd about myself <laughs> it's like it just doesn't you don't go to your GP and just put yourself into the local trans uh, clinic although I'm glad we have trans clinics now it's a long overdue but um do you mind talking about that process what it's like because um I, I mean it, it's like it's bizarre in the media you'd imagine that like the way it works is you wake up one morning and on a whim go and have loads of hormone replacements and it's it's so funny. <laughs> it's like it's like insane what people think but yeah. do you mind telling us a little bit about actually the and, I, and they also say there's a lot of headlines that say that we just give drugs to kids which means it's them saying because <laughs> yeah, right, that's what we, we do we also don't do that because that's right like, it's they get they might you know they go through a whole process don't they they get seen assessed professionals, psychologists, counsellors, then, you know, they might be put on puberty blockers to stop the process of puberty, which we've just described as incredibly... So that they don't kill themselves. So they don't kill themselves. And then they might get put on the... The evidence shows that the process of puberty yeah. is traumatic. <laughs> okay. Exactly. <laughs> they don't have to go through this comfort. And that's, that's not just a kid waking up one day and go to their GP and say, have some hormone blockers, please. Oh, yeah, here you go. No, exactly. they and they go and they have their hormones and surgery later on in their adolescence anyway. It's Absolutely. Like, and so, it so what were the sort of hoops you had to jump through? Do you mind? I don't want to ask you if it's uncomfortable. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll be I'll be absolutely honest because we've got I mean a s severely underfunded NHS and of course yeah. like you know small percentages of the population are going to be last on the pecking order, which does mean that the waiting lists in this country are astronomically long. like they're. Yeah. they're four years wait <laughs> before you even get an assessment and of course when you're faced with a life or death situation for some people it's just not an option um there are private I've, i had to go through various private pathways to actually access surgery i actually went through fundraising to raise for my surgery um because i just couldn't wait and um i started i actually started self-medicating with hormones that's the way i did it but then the doctor prescribed me because duty of care and you know often they'll they'll see it as like we get it you know it can be life or death and um and so now I'm prescribed I luckily found that loophole and got prescribed and go through the NHS but yeah so a combination of NHS and private care um without having gone through the official gender identity waiting list I mean I was on it for a year and a half and then there was an admin error and I had to go start again and I just thought I just I can't I can't wait, you know. Um, You're saying that almost apologetically. I mean, I think it's disgusting that that happened. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. But, but for something with such a high mortality rate, if yeah. half of another set of young people were trying to kill themselves, um, who would be expecting them to wait just to get on a waiting list? I mean, that's just bonkers, isn't it? You know? People do kill themselves because they can't wait. And that is just such a shame. Um, yeah.
And I'm glad you managed to get the money and be creative enough to, um, and sort of, you know, because I, I'm, I do know you, I'm seeing the changes in you and um, the changes that are significant are not necessarily the physical ones, they are to you, but uh, mm -hmm. not to me. As somebody who, uh, who um, you know, loves you very much, the changes that are significant are that you've become happier and, um, and you definitely are. I know. It, it, like wonderful to see. And it, um, I do see it aesthetically, weirdly. I see it, but it's funny, I look over- Because you your vein. <laughs> yeah, I'm so vain. But I look at my eyes and I see this like deadness behind the eyes and they're even bright enough. Yeah. yeah. Significant. And you can see the realness as well. It's just interesting to yeah. before I see this kind of like trying to be feeling uncomfortable to this, oh, this that, this makes sense, you know? And it's, it's yeah. so hard sometimes to put into words, you know? And that's why probably so many people find it difficult to understand and comprehend and identify with. Because sometimes it's something that if you saw happen in front of your eyes, you would understand it without maybe being able to put words to it. Um, yeah. It, 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 you hit the nail on the head. It is about personal happiness. All, all that matters is someone is happy, you know, and free and living. Well, I mean, I guess it's sort of, I mean, I think about it in these terms. I've just knocked the table my um, computer's on. I shall stop it. There we go. Otherwise, James will beat the crap out of me after the show for being unprofessional. I was got a bit overexcited. Sorry, James. Um, but um, it's sort of, uh, did I lose my train of thought? I think I just lost my train of thought. What was I saying? Happiness. Happiness, happiness, yeah. Oh, no, uh, that's what I was saying. Mm. Um, I'm thinking about this thing about um, uh, what's in it for the rest of us. Yeah. Um, so you get personal happiness. But the other thing that's happening is that um, I've seen transformation in the way you engage with the world. Mm. Uh, and this is the thing that um, people don't factor in is this. And it, it's a thing called, um, uh, it's, it, it's a way of thinking about how society works called asset-based community development. And mm -hmm. um, the question always is, why would we as a culture uh, invest in X, Y, or Z, uh, excluded group, da, 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 da. because what happens is that uh, when people can heal in situ in their community, uh, mm -hmm. they then start to put back uh, in rather than take away. Uh, and so historically, um, because of, uh, your psychological state, you were harming yourself, you were using um, a drain on society, if you like, in very simplistic terms. Now you're a contributor to society. And that's what's in it for the rest of us. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Ripple effect as well, you know, one person yeah. getting the effect that can have on other people. Absolutely. And, and that's why it's important that we invest in this stuff. Um, because um, we're going to pay for it one way or another. So we're going to pay for it in people turning up to psych wards because they've tried to kill themselves, or we're going to turn pay for it because you know somebody's got tanked up and um, sort of ended up sort of blacked out in the middle of the road, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So and, and then we pay for the ambulance and the hospital, and so one way or another we're going to pay for it. And it seems to me bonkers that we would pay for the consequences of um, people destroying themselves rather than pay for people being able to become truly happy about themselves and contribute positively to the world. Um, and when it's put in those terms, I think most people can understand, oh, that makes sense. Mm, absolutely. That absolutely makes sense. And there's a great, there's a great image from um, this development theory called asset-based community development. It's sort of you imagine uh, a row of houses sort of a Victorian terrace row. And you would say in, in that house is a drunk and in that house is drug use and the house is da, 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 da. And you can take those people out, right? And you can treat them and then move them somewhere else. You're still left with the other people. But if you don't, if you leave people there and you give them the services they need in that place, what happens is this really remarkable thing where they get well in public in front of everybody else and they inspire other people to change for the better. And then the next person along does that. Okay. Now we have this evidence from community. We also have it as an employment thing. And so employment policies around mental health are very much now try and keep people at work and let them get well while they're at work so that everybody can see it. So all those people that are subclinical struggling are probably going to become clinical at some point and become a drain on you and you'll lose them. They will seek help sooner. And, and it's a virtuous circle from a vic vicious cycle. And that's what's in it for us as a culture. 
Very we create a virtuous circle, right? And, and otherwise, we're literally digging our own grave as a society, and we're just creating a situation in which um, uh, deficits and problems um, grow and grow and grow. And, and that's the point of it, I think. That, that's sort of what's in it for all of us. Um, since, you know, you've gone through this um, sort of period of the dark soul last year and you've come to terms with yourself, what are you working on currently and how can people sort of um, see you and connect with you and what platforms are you on, what projects are you working on and how can we know more about you? I'm very visible on social media. So if anyone wants to follow my journey, I'm at the coming Jude. Um, and I've got a website and I'm, I've done, you know, since obviously I mentioned that COVID hit and it kind of really, you know, stopped me from going out and doing my public speaking work, which I was doing a lot of. I'm doing yeah. doing that again and I'm using Zoom platforms, but I've, I've been speaking to businesses, you know, um, schools all over the country, um, I'm doing talks for, for fire and rescue services and, and all kind of different organisations, just anyone that kind of needs the knowledge and the awareness. And, you know, yeah. so I do a lot of that. So if anyone wants to get in touch and wants, you know, trans awareness training, my story, whatever, um, that's, you know, you can you can get in touch via, via the Instagram or my website, which is, again, www.becomingjude.com. Um, and I've kind of made this Becoming Jude a bit of a brand, like, you know, my experience in becoming who I am um and my authenticity kind of being my superpower you know and um and so yeah I do a lot of the public speaking work and 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 obviously I've, I'm, I'm doing a lot of modeling now as well and that my kind of life is kind of expanding on that front too and um I would just fronted a Harrods campaign well just last summer but that's kind of being revived at the moment and um and hoping to do much more um there's a, there's a few things in the pipeline coming up but I'm not going to get too excited I'm going to not jinx it and see whether they they come into fruition but we'll see um but yeah if anyone wants to know more please do get in touch because I you know I'm happy to answer questions and kind of you know if anything's sort of touched anyone and, anymore. and I think the thing that strikes me Jude why I would sort of promote you yeah. um is that you're um you know you've done the transformation in so many ways but the the sense of you as a comfortable human being really comes across yeah um, and you know if you're a parent and you've got a really upset kid who's confused about these issues, um, they can become unupset really quickly by being able to meet people like Jude and um, and discover that it's going to be all right. Yeah, and you I just do, be I, yourself. I've met these kids in schools. I've met the yeah. trans, and often they'll come out to me, and they're so afraid of coming out to their friends, their teachers, their parents, and. You know, I've met people that unfortunately didn't make the fight because of, you know, and that unfortunately are the statistics. I've met so many of, of these people yeah. across the country. Often I haven't because they've been in the psych ward. Um, but I've met these kids and they're just wonderful, wonderful human beings. And they're just so desperately wanting to be accepted and live and they celebrate who they are. And they do see someone come in and like, I'm kind of no, excuse me, I won't swear, but no shit, it's Jules, <laughs> yeah, Jude, sorry. So uh, see, I do it to myself. I, know, I, I, I so that's my fault. Yeah, <laughs> like reminding you of Jules. <laughs> I did it yesterday on the phone to my agent. But um, <laughs> very com when I'm stood up on stage and I'm like, this is who I am, and I don't care what anyone thinks, and I love this about myself, and I'm proud. Well, it's also, I mean, I think one of the great things we're talking about this for so we need to finish now, but I, I think we'll finish on this. Is that. Um, talking to you I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm partly because I know you but also because of who you are mm. it's just a comfortable conversation and I think a lot of people are uncomfortable about the conversation and some of the people who may be our advocates in the field make it uncomfortable as well I mean that's inevitable um, but you don't I mean you make it very easy to make mistakes because we're going through cultural transitions around this we're trying to wrap our heads around it get the right words, mm. have the conversations so we get to know each other. I've just done it myself, to myself. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's all right. It's not the end of the world, is it? You know no, what I mean? it's fine, because it's we're all... Well, look at that. It's the end of the show, though, I'm afraid. Did you like that, the way I did that? It's quite yeah. good. I thought that was uh, Anyway, it is the end of the show. It's been lovely to catch up with you again. Uh, I'll see you. Um, now you're in London. I'll, I'm sort of coming back next week, so I'll be lying we'll go and have a coffee because we're allowed to leave it i would love that I'd actually... we're allowed to do that again <laughs> 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 it's great all right 
uh, on me. The, the coffee is on me. And um, uh, lovely to see you. And um, great to have everybody with us this evening. It's been a fantastic show. Um, and I'll be back in Blighty next week. We've got another show on. Um, don't know. Actually, no. We don't know who it is yet. We haven't found a person for next week. So if anybody would like to be on the show next week, give us a bell. You can. <laughs> All right, that's the end of us. Bye-bye, folks. You stay with us, Jude, um, and uh, see you all next week. Bye-bye.